Amen. If you have your Bibles, I would most certainly encourage you to join with me in Genesis chapter number 13. Genesis chapter number 13. As you are turning there, let me share this with you. An evangelist is doing a revival meeting. The service was over that night. The pastor said to the evangelist, Be careful on your way home or on your way to the motel. He says, For every mile of road, there's two miles of ditches. Be careful on your way to the motel. For every mile of road, there's two miles of ditches. I've heard it said to me before, boy, keep her between the ditches. It's never been my intent to intentionally say, I'm going to drive into that ditch. I, I just think I'm going to run off the road and drive into that ditch. On the way to work in Salem, one morning, foolishly I left the house and made my way to work. And before I got to work, I had been in three ditches. And the third time that I slipped on the ice and went into the ditch and in somebody's yard, it tailspinned around and I ended up in the lane going the opposite direction as a car went by me smiling. I put it in reverse backed into the driveway of the people's whose yard I had just cleaned out, son. And on the work I went. And you know what I said? Thank you, Jesus. There are twice the mileage of ditches as there are mileage of highway. We just need to learn to keep her out of the ditches. Sometimes Spiritually speaking, without intent, we run off in the ditches on this highway of life. We veer from the straight and narrow way and we get off course. If you're driving down the highway, Normally the way that you run off into the ditch is you start hugging the shoulder and then ignoring those horrible rumble strips that seem to be along our highways, you feel your tires go off onto loose gravel or grass that starts hitting the underside of your vehicle and before you know it, you're just there. It's kind of, though it happens very quickly, in most cases it's kind of a little progression and in slow motion you're trying your best to get back on the highway. But you know what I'm saying? Y'all ever been there in the ditch? Spiritually speaking, sometimes we veer off to the shoulder just a little bit without recognizing it. And we go a little further into the grass or the shoulder without realizing it. And before you know it, we're in the ditch. Beware of backsliding, part two, Jerry. I don't know any other way to put it. This morning, I made a simple comment. Scripture uses several words to describe Backsliding. The, the Blessed King James uses a lot of words that simply mean backsliding. This morning, we looked in Hosea chapter number four 
how that Israel, uh, the indictment was made against them and the words backslide, backslidden. And we understand that Israel chose consciously or unconsciously to leave God's perfect will and plan for their life more than once. I said this morning there are many examples of backslidden conditions throughout Scripture. And the one tonight that comes to my mind or more often is that of Abraham and Lot. The story of Abraham and Lot is a story that most of us learned in Sunday school class. May I say, if you're not here for Sunday school class on Sunday morning, and you remember a time when you used to come to Sunday school on Sunday morning, may I submit to you that you are backslidden in your attendance. In chapter number 13, the Bible says in verse number one that Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the south and Abram was very rich in cattle in silver and in gold and he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai unto the place of the altar which he had made there at first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. I'm going to read this again. Verse number four, he came unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. His first priority was to make an altar, a place to make sacrifice, a place to worship God. Verse four, and Lot also which went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. Lot was no poor man. By any stretch of the imagination, Lot was a wealthy man. I believe that he was wealthy because of his association with Abraham. I believe that God blesses even those outside the Christian faith through born again, blood bought Christians. I believe that the world is blessed today I believe that the United States of America is blessed today because there still are God-fearing Christians who know the importance of worshiping God first and foremost above all else. Above prosperity, above equality, above all else. Lot, I believe, prospered because God blessed him as he went with Abraham. Amen. And the land, verse 6, was not able to bear them that they might dwell together for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled there then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. I'm not sure if that's proper English today, we be brethren. But abounding hope, we be brethren, if we know the Lord Jesus as our Savior, as our Redeemer. It's one thing to know Christ as Savior, it's another thing to continually worship him as Lord. 
Today, in the United States of America, there exists more strife, perhaps in any time in our history. I might even go so far as to say it could be greater than the days of the Civil War, perhaps. Differentiating opinions. Abraham, in verse 8, said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Abraham's heart was for God. Abraham meant good. When he says to Lot, choose whatever it is that you want, and I'll take the other. It was a point in their history in which Abraham compromised what could have been best for him in a good way so that Lot would be content and Lot would be happy. Sometimes we do have a need to compromise what's best for us so that others may prosper. Can I get a witness? The problem is too much compromise brings too much strife. Okay. Y'all got that? Y'all say with me, we be brethren. I just like to say that. We be brethren. Y'all don't enjoy it as much as I do. I'm going to work in the morning so when I see Dennis, I'm going to say, hey, we be brethren. We need to stand together. We be brothers and sisters in Christ. Sometimes we as Christians forget the importance of unity. And we allow differences of opinion to separate us. I am of the opinion that marriage is between a man and a woman and that's not my opinion. Get mad at me if you want to. It, my opinion is God's opinion. I guess it is my opinion. But it was God's opinion first. And if I'm going to be opinionated, I won't be accused of having the opinion of God. Amen. Amen. And if that brings strife between me and someone else, then so be it. There's just going to be a point of contention. But guess what? I can still be civil to someone with whom I disagree. We don't always like it. And I'll be honest with you. I just got to be dead level honest with you. There may still be a time in my life when I see someone walk around the corner of that produce department and I choose to go to the back room just so I don't come face to face with them because I want to avoid contention. I'm on God's side. If you're not on God's side and I have talked and we've talked and we've talked, then I really don't have much to say to you in many circumstances. Uh, there might be a part three coming on this. More labels. I'm just saying... The Bible does not teach us to compromise who we are in Christ and the values we have in Christ just to avoid contention from those who oppose what's right in the sight of the Lord. There are times when we might comfort, uh, 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 compromise our comfort so that others can be blessed so that others can prosper uh, above ourselves so that others can receive perhaps even a blessing that someone would have given us. 
Is any of this making sense to you tonight? Some of you are lost, but I can't start over now. Abraham says, in verse 9, Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee for me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. We have to make sacrifices in our life sometimes to avoid contention. Notice verse number 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld, and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. He looked and he saw the plain, the valley, and he saw the beauty of the valley, and he saw the resource of the valley, and he compared the resources of this valley to some of the greatest known places of the day and the resources that were available there. He saw things from a physical perspective and he chose what seemed most prosperous opportunity for him. Amen. 11, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and there separated themselves, then one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities in the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of the Sodom were wicked, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Let's just uh, move down to verse 18, where we find, and Abraham removed his tent and dwelt in the plain of Mamre. They're separating now, and he's going to the place. He's going to the highlands, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. You understand, the first thing that he did when he and Lot arrived together was build an altar. Now he has spoken to Lot, and he says, you go your way, I'll go my way, it's best for us. I still love you, Lot, but it's best we go different directions here. And when he moved, the first thing that he did was build an altar. Everywhere that Abraham landed or traveled to or settled in, there was always an altar built in reverence and respect to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that we have the opportunity tonight to consider your word and that we have this time together through which you can speak. I pray that you would help me to say only those things tonight that are profitable in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. When you see Lot and you see Abraham, you see two different personalities you see men that have two different characters. Abraham is known at this point of his life, he was always known as being strong in the faith. However, we know there were times when his faith was not as strong as it should have been. And yes, he made bad decisions. And yes, he trusted his way of thinking uh, more than God's way of thinking. Yes, he made mistakes. But overall, Abraham was viewed as a man of faith and obedience unto God, surrendered unto God. He is associated with altars everywhere that he went. Those altars are a picture they speak of. They present unto us his spirit of devotion and repentance. Amen. Lot, on the other hand, is a picture of a person who is weak in his devotions. He had flocks, he had herds, he had tents, but he had no altar. The altar speaks of devotion and repentance. The altar speaks of humility. The altar speaks of one acknowledging their sin before God. Your life and my life will never amount to much of anything if there are no altar experiences along the way. Your life 
and my life will never amount to very much if there are no altar experiences along the way. Someone has said the greatest need in the church today is for Christians to let the altar alter their manner of living. A sign of a backslidden condition is no sign of repentance in your life. If you never feel the need to repent of your sins, you are a backslider. I'm just saying it as plain as I know how. With no altars, a person will choose the path of lustful reasoning. I read that somewhere in the devotion book. With no altars, a person will choose the path of lustful reasoning. The problem is, Lot walked by sight, whereas Abraham walked by faith. Lot saw something that he wanted so badly that he did not consider the consequence of what having that might bring in his life. He wanted it so bad that he was willing to forsake all else to get it. You hear me? He was willing to cast aside the example of devotion that he had seen with Abraham. Until this point in time, everywhere that Abraham went, Lot was with him. The first thing Abraham does is build an altar and worships the Lord. And Lot was in the perfect example of a man who acknowledged sin and who acknowledged his need of repentance. And yet Lot forgot all about that example when he selfishly chose to go to the place where he thought he could prosper the most. The United States of America, in large, has forgotten the rewards and the blessings of repentance and worshiping the Lord in sight of or in lieu of or have chosen instead to try to seek prosperity by allowing things to crumble all around us, by allowing our moral standard to come unravel. The fiber that was America has become unraveled and we have chosen to accept that and we have chosen to celebrate that very fact and we have forgotten the need for repentance and acknowledging that we are a sinful people and if you feel no need to repent anywhere in your Christian life, then you are backslidden. Remorseful repentance. Unlike this morning when we talked about the problem was the priests were taking all the sacrifices that the Israel brought and was saying, okay, you're all right now. You just go back to do what you were doing without ever telling them you need to stop what you're doing so you don't have to bring these sacrifices. Huh? With no altars, a person will choose the path of lustful Reasoning, and we will think we will get whatever we want to make our lives better without reasoning the cost. There is a high cost today in low living. Number two, with no altars, a person will choose the path of least resistance. Lot chose the well watered pasture land. It was the lowland. You'll find that Abraham settled in higher ground. Coincidence? It's a picture of someone who lowers their moral standards taking the low ground and someone who has higher standards takes the high ground and separates themselves from the activities of the lowland. I love Old Testament pictures like this that have such a profound meaning for us 
and portray for us a very clear, distinctive difference in the lifestyles of individuals. Lot lived his life looking through his eyes. What's best? What makes me happy? What I want most? Whereas Abraham lived his life, what makes God happy? How can I be pleasing to God? And there is a great moral divide in those two lifestyles. Someone has said, rivers and men become crooked by following the line of least resistance. I wish I'd think of stuff like that. Rivers and men become crooked by following the line of least resistance. It is hard to realize temptations sometimes. It's hard to make hard decisions that we know will not be popular among those around us. Sometimes we just want to be left alone and make it through life without any resistance, without meeting any resistance, being able to get along with everybody, embracing everyone and not doing anything or not saying anything that may seem controversial and just any way that we can go without finding resistance, then that's the way we choose to go. The line of least resistance is not the straight and narrow way. The law could not resist the sinful lifestyle of those with whom he chose to dwell. He left Abraham I believe he forsook Abraham and decided he didn't want nothing to do with Abraham. The Bible doesn't say that. I guess that's a part of my sanctified imagination, if you will. But I believe that when he went his way, he just shunned Abraham. But Abraham still loved Lot. Amen? God still loves sinners. He always has and he always will. With no altars, a person will choose the path of lustful reasoning. I'm going to get all I can that makes it better for me. They will choose the path of least resistance. I don't want to make no waves. I just want to get along. I want to live and let live. If they want to be that way, let them be that way. Number three, with no altars, a person will choose the path of loose restriction. Loose restriction. How many of you like rules and regulations? Be honest. I can think of some I don't like, and I know that there are some that are good. Rules and restriction. When Lot lost his altar, he left the presence of Abraham where there was an altar. It eventually cost him his tent. When he lost his altar, he lost his tent. When he lost his altar, he lost the blessings of God and ultimately we know what happened. If you continue the course of backsliding before long, you will lose your detachment to society and you'll just say, why can't we all just get along? I won't say nothing bad about you and, and you don't say nothing bad about me. Amen? I won't condemn you, 
You just leave me alone. I won't say nothing about your lifestyle. You just let me live my lifestyle. It is a sad indictment against the Christian community when we accept things as they are without any resistance whatsoever. If you don't resist ungodliness, if you don't stand against ungodliness, then you are not standing firmly in the faith that God expects you to have. You are backslidden. If you never voice your opinion, which it should be God's opinion, if you never say, Thus saith the Lord, if you never begin with the sentiment, the word of the Lord said this morning, the word of the Lord must be spoken. Sin is still sin. It doesn't matter if you dress it up or not. You can put a dress on a pig. You can put lipstick on a pig. And Lonnie, you can kiss the pig if you want to. But just because it's got lipstick and just because it's got a beautiful dress on does not mean it's worthy of your kiss. I'm sorry, Connie, that's not meant towards you whatsoever. You understand that. Hmm? I don't care. Lonnie, go kiss a pig. I don't care. But if you do, do it where ain't nobody looking for crying out loud. Huh? Because then surely it would be all right. That, brothers and sisters, is the attitude that was in the 60s and the 70s. Go ahead and do what you're going to do. But just do it where I can't see it. And it'll be all right. And then the attitude of the 80s and the 90s. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do it behind closed doors. And you're going to have to accept what I'm doing. Because that's just how it's going to be. And in the 2000s, the attitude turns, I'm not doing it behind closed doors where you can't see me. I'm not expecting you to accept what I'm doing. I'm demanding that you applaud what I'm doing as being a normal act of society. Closer from the altar of repentance and closer to Sodom has America traveled. And it seems in my lifetime, we've done so very quickly. If there is not an altar of repentance in your life, you are not on the straight and narrow highway that God has instructed you to travel. You're either veering off on the rumble strip, you're on the shoulder of the road, or the grass is just popping the bottom of your vehicle because you are all the way in the ditch. I'm glad God will always be with me in this journey of life. He needs to be more than my co-pilot. He needs to be my pilot, my driver, and the director of my pathway. And I need to consider what he thinks is best for me. 
and apply that to my everyday living or I am on the pathway to the ditch in a backslidden condition. Next week will be part three. There needs to be a time in your life where you kneel before God publicly, privately, and confess your sins. And if you think you have no sin, nothing to repent of, then you need to bring your backslidden self to a point where you say, God, show me my shortcomings and then quietly seek the direction of the Lord and He will reveal to you an area in your life that ain't exactly what it ought to be. I want all four wheels on the highway and I don't want to be close to the ditch. To God be the glory. Heavenly Father, I thank you again, Lord Jesus, for this opportunity to stand and share your word. And I pray, Lord God, that something that's said tonight will be encouraging, will be challenging, will be edifying, will bring conviction. Lord, I believe I've said what you would have me to say. And so therefore, Lord, I leave it in your hands saying no more. May you be pleased with our activities on this evening in Jesus' name. Amen.